and welcome to Babbles Travelling Yarns. Um, I'm Grace, I'm an Irish girl who lives in Ireland at the moment. <clears throat> it's called Babbles Travelling Yarns because when I started this podcast I was travelling around the world and um, yeah I still do quite a bit of travelling but I'm settled back in Ireland now in Limerick which is in the west coast of Ireland uh, southwest. <clears throat> And this week I'm going to be talking about my uh, knitting projects on, um, uh, so my hand spun knitting sweater. I'm going to be talking about um, a, a sock yarn that I have been given to review. And um, also I'm going to be talking a little bit about a tiny little sock project that I'm working on for preparation for my first ever knitting class. I'm going to be talking a little bit more about um, the new sweater patterns because I'm just about to cast off my other sweater and then I'm going to be talking about be having some discussions around um, racism in Ireland specifically to do with um, direct provision. So if you're interested in that hang on till the end and there will be some more discussions about racism in the uh, knitting community as well during this podcast. So I hope you will listen with an open mind and if I do make any mistakes please reach out and let me know and I, um, I will work to be better. So thank you so much for those who have reached out to me and had chats about things. Thank you so much to Shannon of Socks Etc podcast for um, for following, or for uh, we had a little chat this morning. I was having some kind of difficult conversations in my head, and I just needed to get them out and talk to somebody. And uh, I really appreciate that Shannon let me do that. So she says hi to everybody as well. <laughs> so I'm going to do a little bit of a special announcement. Um, so I'm going to be hosting a cow a knit along or a craft along or a make along, you can crochet as well. So I was approached by Marsha from the uh, Fairy Little podcast and she contacted me and said, hey Grace, do you want to do a, a cal together? Do you want to co-host a cal? And I was like, yes, sure. I've just finished my epic along and um, I have a couple of people who still need to get back to me about if they won or not. Go back and look and check to see if you won. If you didn't, I'm recalling. Um, so um yeah so I um I said yeah sure definitely what do you want it to be about and she was like well maybe cables and I was like okay I could do that because I still have to put sleeves on this bad boy so I was like hey that sounds perfect can we do whips and she's like yeah totes so whips are allowed I'm gonna put some sleeves on this maybe hopefully uh, <laughs> so I said yeah that'd be great so she said um was there anyone else that um we could think about um um, asking to join us in the knit along and I'd been doing a huge amount of research not research what kind of fun research I've been investigating loads of new podcasters that I found from um, a couple of um, oh the olive trees I'm gonna put down here but she has a huge list on her highlights of um, podcasters of um, black indigenous and people of color so I found a ton of new podcasts and one of my absolute favorites which I'm falling in love with so fast is the knitting a liar at uh, knitting annihilator and I can't spell annihilator but luckily my autocorrect does so it'll be down there just down below so Akira is this gorgeous girl she's um she's about 24 I think she's a beautiful little baby age who, who is um, her co-host and so she's a working mummy she is an incredible knitter and I'm so excited to that she I, so I, I reached out to her and I asked listen Akira you don't know me I'm really sorry but what do you think about maybe co-hosting a cal together with myself and Marsha on cables it's going to run for two months from the first of February and she was like yes so there we go so she's currently knitting a lovely sweater with a cable at the bottom so she's like yes our whips allowed I was like yes whips are allowed <laughs> So I'm really excited about it. So that's going to kick off from the 1st of February. The hashtag to follow is um, um, CableCal2019 or Cable Mal, Cable M-A-L 2019. So that's to include crochet, um, anything you can cable with really. Um, I think you can cable with crochet. I haven't done it, but I've seen some beautiful cable patterns that I thought were knitting but they were actually crochet so that sounds amazing so yeah and I really do need to get this done so this will help me push this over the line so the rules which I should have written down anyway um we're going to have um 
chatter threads and fo threads in all three of our accounts uh, on Ravelry on all three of our Ravelry groups you have to be a member of all three to take part we will be comparing notes <laughs> you um, have to be following all three of us on Instagram and there'll also be an Instagram giveaway so I'm going to be supplying some yarn prizes uh, Marsh is going to be supplying some pattern prizes and we're all going to be kind of chipping in on like different stuff different, different stash stuff so it's going to be so fun I hope you enjoy uh, if anyone is interested in donating some prizes for the cow um, do let me know I've got a couple of things that people have sent me that I'd love to engage include so um yeah so it's gonna be so exciting if you don't follow akira and the knitting annihilator podcast and if you don't follow marcia the fairy little podcast they're incredible they're so good marcia's been around for well actually i met her first when i well I, I met her i found her first when i was looking for irish knitting podcasts and she had basically visited ireland and there weren't many irish knitting podcasts at the time so um yeah that was really fun to see um to see her and her sister Scylla. so that was really good Scylla is now um she's studying far away from home so she doesn't and she's not in the podcast anymore but um i just love both of them and akira i cannot wait to meet Akira at some point in my life. I feel like it's gonna happen. She's so, so, so sweet. She is uh, friends with Kalisha of the um, Monday Craft, Quirky Monday Craft cast. And um, yeah, I just love watching her. Her her podcast is very chill. It's, um, it's really like, you know, you go in, it's like visiting a friend at their house. And um, the, like Aiden is running around being a little, I think he's just over two, he's just over one, I think he's between one and two years old he's running around causing havoc anyway super fun um so um i think he's just over one is he almost one he's adorable anyway but um yeah so it's really chill it's lovely it's like going over to her house and having a cup of tea or having a coffee with her um at her house so it's really lovely i love joining it i love it, I love it, I love it. and um yeah she just has the best smile and the best voice, I could just listen to her all day. So it's really, really good. Totes, watch it, totes. So that is um, the knit along that's gonna be happening. So it's gonna run from the 1st of first of February, which is St. Bridget's Day in Ireland. It's kind of the start of spring. And then it's going to run until the 30th of March. So while I'm in Edinburgh. So do you know what I was thinking actually? That top, that top with the Oh yeah, I might talk about it later on actually. Yeah. So, oh, this cable's running up the sides and it's got like strip. <gasps> yeah, I'm gonna do that. So, so exciting. Please come join us. We'd love to have you. And uh, there's gonna be loads of opportunities for prizes, loads. It's gonna be an Instagram thread. There's gonna be, um, and three or three, actually six Ravelry group threads, which is possible to win in. Um, obviously FO threads are only for finished objects. There's no chatter in the FO threads. And um, yeah, I'm gonna link down below to all of the different threads. And uh, I think you can start chattering away uh, on, on ideas of what you would like to do. I'm hopefully going to be releasing a couple of video tutorials on how to cable without a cable needle to help you speed up your, your cabling. Um, uh, I find it's, I, I, I released them on Instagram a couple of weeks ago and I think people found them super useful. So I'm going to do that again, film properly um, with some nice light and uh, you might be able to see what's going on. So yeah. Enjoy. <laughs> so let's get started. We'll start with the knitting. <laughs> so excited. Okay, so I am so close, so close, so close to finishing. Um, I thought that I would maybe finish it this morning, but I was having too much fun talking. So here we are. <clears throat> here we are. I'm down to one ball. I've been knitting with three balls pretty much all the time, all the way down. And here we go. So it ended up being uh, half, half, half arms. Um, and that's because I ran out of yarn. So let me talk a little bit about this. If this is your first time to the podcast, I talk a lot more about this sweater in the last two podcasts. And I've been spinning the yarn for about a year. This is a fractal spun sweater. And what that means is that I had three braids of 100 gram fiber 
or four ounces. I don't know why fiber is weighed in ounces and yarn is weighed in grams. I don't know. Anyway, they're around the same. And um, yeah, so I spun each yarn. I split the braid in half. So I had three braids. I split each braid in half and I spun one half of the braids um, just straight. So I had long repeats of color. And then the second half of the braid, I split into tiny little pencil rovings. And I wonder if I have, I think, I don't know if I have it anymore. I've been playing with it so much, pulling it out and putting it back in. I don't know, maybe it's gone somewhere. But I had a little sample. Oh, there it is. Ah, it's from last week's podcast. So this is the, the braid. And this is how the colour sequence was through the whole braid. So this is one of the little tiny strips that I just kept as a sample. And <clears throat> so what happens is when you spin one long braid, like a thicker braid, you get long repeats of colour. So you, you might get you know, 50, 60 yards or 50, 60 meters in this blue. And then, you know, this one would probably have about, you know, 180 gram or 180 meters of brown. And then, you know, so you'd have really long, long repeats. Um, so you're spinning the same color for a long time and then it changes. And then on the other, on the second bobbin, you have shorter repeats because you've less fiber in there. So you're repeating, you're basically doing kind of like a self-striping yarn. So you'd have a short repeat of maybe, I don't I'm making up numbers here, but maybe say five, five, five meters of blue and five meter and ten meters of brown and four, and then you'd go start again. So you'd have really quick repeats on the second bobbin. Beans, you just want to say hi, and then he just walks off. He just likes to open doors. So then what you do is when you actually ply them together, you get a lot of uh, you get your base color that changes really slowly. It's almost like, you know, those um, Fair Isle designs where you have one color that fades slowly and the background color kind of stays the same. Do you know what I mean? So it, it kind of fades through. But um, with this one, you get the brown, like the, it starts off, it started off with the blue and then it'll ply in. So you'll get specks of, you'll get stripes of brown in with the blue. It'll be marled. And then, yeah, so <clears throat> let me show you what I was doing. So I did three braids like that. And then I started knitting from the same end of all of the three balls. So what I wanted to do was keep all the blue. I wanted to have actually a garment that had this type of fade through the whole thing, but spin it and control the yarn. Now I learned about this technique from an amazing woman and her book uh, called, she's called Alana Wilcox. And it, uh, she goes by Spinny Buns on Instagram. And she has a book called A New Play on Colour. If you're interested in learning how to do this, um, I would really recommend this book. She does go into how to spin for garments. And she talks about how to spin differently for a colour braid for the body and then the arms, because the repetition on the arms and the striping is different. It's a fantastic book anyway. I did a review a couple of the links ago. I'll find it and pop it down below. If I don't, just message me and I'll, I'll send it to you. So <clears throat> you can see here what's happened is quite similar, right? So I started off with the blue on top and then it fades into the brown section here. And then it's another blue section in the middle and then the brown section at the bottom. And there's a little, little tiny blip of blue again coming in just here. So let's go closer and have a little look at what's happening. I've, I've explained this like three times, but I think people love it when I explain it because it's a little bit complicated. Itchy nose. So if you see here, there's a blue section and you get these stripes of the brown through the blue, but the blue is always the background color. It's always one of the plies coming down, coming down, coming down. And then the brown turns into the main color and it fades really nicely. And you get strips of blue in there that are marled in. So yeah. So the body worked out really well. Now the arms I've been working a little bit differently. I started with this one and I, I controlled this quite a lot. I would stop knitting with one colour if I found it was getting too stripey. So that was happening up here, it was too stripey. The, the repeats were just too, too long and it would just end up like a big stripey arm. And I didn't really want that. I wanted to kind of mirror the blue, the brown, blue, brown, blue. And, it, and I made it work a little bit like that. It was a little bit forced. You can see where it kind of stopped. Oh, can you? 
yeah just here I stopped using the brown I wanted more blue I, I wanted less stripes so I stopped doing my helical knitting if you're here by the way from Amy at Stranded Dye Works she did a shout out recently on my jogless join tutorial hi thank you so much for coming over that's really nice of Amy to do that um so I was doing helical knitting the whole time or doing a jogless join the whole time with three balls of yarn and I stopped this one. I just dropped the yarn and I just knit straight over it because I, I, I wanted to do a little bit more blue. So then there is a little uh, a little float behind there to join again when I wanted to add in a bit more brown again. I kind of wish I'd done that a little bit more under the armpit, but actually when it's on, it will be under the armpit. I don't think you'll see it. Um, there's a, there is one on this side, which you can see, but it's on the back, so I don't care. <laughs> anyway, nobody's going to know. So, um, oh, the pattern. The pattern is by Isabel Kramer. It's the Yume sweater, um, which is a lovely top-down um, yoked sweater. All the increases are done um, uh, just in the top there. Very easy, super, super simple. And yeah, so there is a couple of different choices. I was half thinking about leaving it as a t-shirt and then I was like, I want to use all the yarn. Anyway, so I was trying to manage the yarns and then I kind of ran out of one of the balls a little bit sooner than the other. So <clears throat> I think it's fine. Like it's hand spun. It's not going to be the same. It's not going to be matchy matchy, but you've got the general gist like that. It's kind of gone from blue and then there was a bit, m bit more brown and then it kind of fades deep into brown at the bottom but it's fine. Now, so I've just picked up this, well, I'm just in the middle of picking up stitches on uh, around the bottom there. I had it on waist yarn just because uh, I did, I did this one first and then I did this one and I just finished off with the, this was the last ball and I've got one more ball now, which I'm just going to do the ribbing on. So you can see if I was to just do because the rest of the body and the sleeves were all using the joggers join. So I was alternating skeins throughout the whole body and the sleeves. But on the ribbing, I decided, no, I'm just going to use one ball for the ribbing. And you can see the way that the, the yarn would come up if I just knit with one ball at a time. Now with hand spun, it's, it's a little bit different because you're going to get stripes, basically. Um, so I, I didn't really want stripes. I wanted a fade. So that's why I decided to do it all um, with the jogless join. So this is what it would have looked like on the sleeve if I'd just done one. I would have had like long stripes of colour, which is really cute. I love this on the sleeve, but I really didn't. I, I, I love it on the ribbing, but I didn't want it on the whole thing. And then down the bottom here, you can see the stripes there coming in. Almost looks like fair isle, doesn't it? It's really cool. Anyway, or it looks like, do you know the... Um, corrugated rib that the Fair Isle has. But this is just a twisted rib at the bottom, which is part of the pattern. And then I just did a, um, that bind off is really pretty, isn't it? Uh, I can't remember what bind off it was. I think it was just a normal bind off. Yeah, I think it was just a normal bind off on a larger needle. That's what I did, I think. Ooh, it has been a while. Um, yeah, so I, bound off on this one. It's a little bit less nice. Oh, do you know what? Because I started doing a pearl. I don't know what I did. Anyway, I wanted it nice and stretchy to go over because it's going to be on the on the edge here, on the on the elbow joint. So I wanted it nice and stretchy and it will stretch out, I think. God, what bind off did I use there? It was really nice. Dang. I think it's just a normal bind off. Yeah, anyway. So that's how far I'm going to be done this by today or tomorrow. Um, so that's going to be awesome. So I started um, putting markers in every time I decreased. Um, oh yeah. So I, uh, with the pattern, um, to be honest, I don't really use a pattern past splitting for the sleeves. I use the pattern to cast on, I use it for the sh yoke increasing, I use it for the shoulder shaping, and I use it to kind of take off a certain amount on, around the sleeves, and then I just kind of do whatever I want. On a top-down sweater, I generally just put it on, 
I, there was no shaping with this, it was perfect. There's a gorgeous little um, faux seam on the edge there with just a purl stitch and it's just so nice and satisfying and <gasps> it just fades straight into the rib, which makes me like so happy. Can you see that? Can you see it? Oh, it matches up so nice. Oh, heaven on earth. Um, and you can see it really well on the inside as well, actually. I suppose that's what they use for that weekender sweater that's going around, the Andrea Mary weekender sweater. It's really nice. Um, yeah, so that's really nice. I decided to continue that up the arm because you'd have that sleeve pattern. Um, I decided to carry that on up the inside of the arm so it looks like a faux seam all the way up. And it matches there as well. Happy days. So I uh, decreased quite a lot. Um, from I, I picked up quite a lot of stitches under the arm here because from Isabel Kramer's class, um, you just need a little bit. I, I took a class with Isabel Kramer on short row shaping, on short row sleeve caps um, in uh, Barcelona and it was fantastic. And uh, yeah, I, so I learned that you need to have more stitches underneath here um, just for movement and, and sort of stuff. So. I had quite a lot of stitches and then what I did was I got a measuring tape and I measured around around this part of my arm and then around to the bottom and I didn't know how long how much yarn I had so I uh, basically did a difference between this arm and this part of my arm and then divided it up over how many centimeters that distance was and then I, it basically said that I needed to decrease every um, every two centimeters or something, just like a, to, I needed to, to, to get down there, I needed to decrease quite quickly. Um, and I think it's gonna be quite, I haven't actually tried it on in a while, but it, it was looking fine. It seems like a very fast decrease, doesn't it? Let me just take this off so I can see. Actually, yeah. Like it fits, it's not too tight. Hopefully, I'm good. It's not blocked either, actually, at the moment, obviously. Oop. I only have half the stitches picked up. Oh, look! I love it so much! So, I need to do a bit of fiddling just to... Oh, it's so nice. You may sweater. If you want to knit it, it's gorgeous. Really well written even though I haven't looked at the pattern in the last <laughs> two weeks because <laughs> I'm just doing my own thing. So it's I like the tight little sleeves actually. Quite nice. So this is where I am. So it actually comes down, so this is my elbow crease. So actually that's where I love my sleeves ending. Most of my um, yeah, oh, I love it. <gasps> Look at that little line. Isn't that so neat? So neat. Oh my God, I did it, guys. I can't believe it. Almost, almost. We're nearly there. We're nearly there. <gasps> oh, I love it. It's the prettiest. Can I, I wonder, can I get a nice screenshot? <laughs> because I end up going back over all the pictures and I was just like so I'm a little bit like it's a little bit bunchy here and I made a bit of a boo-boo actually last week I was saying about how I have one needle size smaller on the left hand side when I'm knitting but I did some short rows and I didn't change the needle size so there are some rows in the back which are knit on a smaller gauge because you're going back and forth but I don't think you can see it Maybe there's a little bit of tightness there, but yeah, it's fine. And that was done just to push up the back a teeny tiny bit. Just a little bit. You can kind of see it there that rises a little higher and comes down in the back of front. Cool. So, yes. So I'm working away on that. Oh, very high up. Actually, I love that. And, I, and the uh, the corrugated rib makes it kind of a lovely little lovely shape. 
so pretty. So this is gonna be my EYF sweater. Are you going to EYF? I can't wait to see if you do. Give me a hug. Now, so that is that. I might need to take this off though because this got this extra ends. If you see, I've got three ends coming off the sleeve at different points because I was in the middle of doing the round thing, but yeah. So I'm gonna do a few more rounds with those little ends. I just love it. Love the iron so much. Love it. Love it. Mm. Anyway, what was I talking about? Okay, let's go back. Let's go back. So, um, yeah, that's what I've been knitting on pretty much only. Um, I have been knitting on a few other things, um, but they're mainly kind of um, job related, not really job related, but um, they're not like project related. <clears throat> so <clears throat> when I was back, when I was back in England in Christmas time, at Christmas time, I, um, I often go across to John Arbin, to the mill there, and I asked this time if I could have an interview with John Arbin of John Arbin. I met him a couple of times and um, yeah, so he, we said yes, they said yes. And I had a little interview and I'm just in the middle of editing it at the moment. And uh, they were talking about, they were, they were talking about the, this new sock yarn that they're just bringing out. They're actually relaunching their sock yarn, which is the Exmoor sock yarn. And I talk a little bit about it in that video, but this is where it is here. So this is the, the working title. Um, it's not uh, the final title, but this is the shade card that I got. And there's some gorgeous colors on there. I love this one, Admadod. So all the names are actually related to um, typical Devon terms, terminology, and the, it's all on the website, what the, the names and then what they mean. Admadod means snail, I know that. Um, Hortleberries are blueberries, so this is this blue here. Dimity is that lovely teal, very pretty. Quick beam, it's almost, it's like fox-like, isn't it? Quick beam, I wonder. Um, I was given a, um, a choice and I picked this one, it's beautiful, it's called Belle Heather. And um, I'm, I know that I had some heather and it has these beautiful kind of bell shaped flowers that are that shade of kind of magenta, really. Absolutely gorgeous. So this is the little sample that I got, 50 gram. They come in 50 gram skeins and I believe they cost seven pounds for 50 gram skeins. So, and I've seen some absolutely amazing color work socks in these. So let's talk a little bit about it. They're worsted spun because John Arbin is a worsted mill. It's a four ply yarn, 50 gram, 50 gram hanks, approximately 200 meters. Composition is 60% Exmoor blue face, 20% Coradale, 10% Svartblis and 10% nylon superwash. So this is possibly yarn that will outlive us all. <laughs> it has, it's just, you can, oh, I love this when I show it on here because you can just see that like it has a, a like a deep so Zvortplus are a black sheep they actually look like these these are Zvortplus so they have they add this extra dimension to yarn when you add a bit of Zvortplus it adds a little bit of grey and then when the dye hits the yarn it actually has like like shimmers underneath it just a bit of depth without having to add black dye um so it's so I've been knitting with it, just a little sample, just a tiny little sample of it. And um, so <clears throat> what John was saying that was basically that it's uh, the yarn is, it feels quite, it feels very sturdy. It feels quite, st very strong, like you could bale twine with it, bale hay with it, not really. But when it, when you wash it actually, the, the it actually relaxes out and becomes really fluffy and soft, kind of like, um, you know those finulgarn, you know the the ice the uh, the Norwegian wools where when you actually wash it they bloom and they become so soft. So I'm so excited to wash this but I've been knitting on it and it's just coming up like the stitch definition is incredible. Very, very beautiful. I love it. I love this colour as well. I was actually I was actually thinking of maybe getting two and doing a colourwork socks, but I'm like oh. 
I've got so much on. But it's a plan. It's a plan in my future. I love it there. It's a very woolly yarn. Um, but it's not like... It reminds me, it's a very sturdy, sturdy sock yarn, which is what I want more for socks. I've had a couple of socks wear through and they were like merino nylon um, standard sock kind of base. And I'm just like, mm, not, you know, I can always fix them. I can always mind them. And to be honest, I don't really mind if, if I wear my socks out because that means I'm wearing them and I'm using them. But this will definitely last. And there's just some incredible colours in there. So I'm thinking these two would make an incredible colour work sock. This one, this one, amazing. I love this one and this one together. So that's Mackerel Sky and Belle Heather together. And she's got like, there's some neutrals in here. So it's like a dark neutral. And then, um, so this is Bouldering Clouds. You know that clouds where it's about to like drench you. And then Mizzle, which is Drist, Drizzle and Mist. I want to say Drist and Mizzle and I'm like, no. Drist could be a good word though. Mm -hmm. um, and then dimity. I don't know what dimity means, but it's all on the website. Yeah. So I've been working away on that and it's just been so lovely. Ooh, my ball. My ball has escaped. So yeah, I'm loving it. I'm loving it. And I'm wondering, is 50 grams enough to make like a small pair of socks? I don't think it is, not for my feet. My feet are a little bit large, but maybe a hat. I could do one of Barbara's hats. She uses a very small amount, really, of yarn in her fingering weight hats. <sighs> idea, idea. So, yeah. And when I was there as well, I managed to sneak sneak away. So you can do a, a, a mill tour. I managed to sneak away with some beautiful, um, I don't know what this is, actually. I think this is Exmoor Blueface, some fluff. And then uh, sometimes when they're clearing the bobbins, they'll actually just make up like mutant skeins. So this is one of them. <laughs> he was basically just showing us how how we ply and how, so he was just, he was just using up the ends of bobbins and this is what I came up with. This is kind of, so no one else has this color. Oh, that's from Chili Knits. Oh, that's when I started knitting my Chili Knits cow. So pretty. Yeah. Yeah, so this is what I came away with. Isn't that lovely? Oh, I love, I love John Urban, actually. I really do. He's funny. <laughs> so, yeah, hopefully that video will be up by the time this video is up. I just need to do a little bit more editing on it and to add some links. So while we were there, um, I also did a lot of um, uh, filming of the tour of the mill but um what we decided to do because i also i went with bex from tiny fiber studio and tiny fiber uh, she got a lot of lovely footage so we, what we decided was instead of putting pretty much the exact same footage just shot from different angles up we would put um two separate videos up so she would put the mill tour up on her channel and i would put the interview with john on mine so if you're interested in seeing the mill tour pop over to tiny fiber studio link down below and um yeah and hopefully I'll have I'll have the other one up pretty soon. I just need to edit one more thing or two more things. So yeah, <clears throat> so um, the other thing I've been knitting has been um, a little kind of test. Um, so uh, I don't know if you watched the last video that I put up. It was a little vlog type video and um, it was about going up to the Irish crafters uh, space in Ardrahan in Galway and uh, just up um, the motorway from Limerick and uh, we were, I was talking with Sandra and we've decided that my first class is going to be on the 30th of March just after Edinburgh after I get back it's going to be on the 30th of March I'm going to be teaching a beginners to intermediate sock knitting class and it's going to be a whole day and I'm going to teach you everything, <laughs> maybe. So at the moment I'm working on um, how to, like the different type of size to knit um, that I could maybe get people knitting it in a day. Um, I, I'm, 
probably people aren't going to be like there's going to be lots of different abilities in the class um, if you're interested in the class I'm going to put a link down below where you can register your interest with Sandra and um, we can get going from there so very exciting uh, so that's going to be the Saturday after Edinburgh Yarn Festival which I think is the 30th of March um, yeah so it's going to be from about 10 o'clock until 5, 4 or 5 o'clock. And it's going to be tea, cake and um, yeah. Um, it's a bring your own lunch deal, I think. But there is also accommodation available if you're interested in staying over and going back on the Sunday if you have a, a distance to travel. So definitely um, link down uh, if you want to message me or you can uh, message Sandra directly who is in charge of the shop. So <clears throat> this is the beginnings of my little tiny sock. It's so small. I just cast on, I think I cast on like 24 stitches or something. Um, it's a bit fiddly. I'm going to be teaching um, magic loop um, because that's what I know. Um, but we can also talk a little bit, uh, we're going to talk a little bit about DPNs and um, yeah, but it's going to be basically uh, all about knitting in the round. Uh, so learning how to do magic loop without twisting it, learning knit purl, how to avoid a, a ladder up the side with your magic loop, um, and then your heel. Now I'm not sure what to do. I I have a little bit of a a funny heel that I put on most of my things, and it's kind of a fish lips kiss hybrid. So I was wondering about that. The beans uh, oh. interlude. Interlude of beans, 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 beans. Also, my brother just called me from Australia and I'm like, Jane, for beans, Jane, whoever, I'm doing my podcast. I'm very busy. Oh, look at those eyes. <gasps> look at those eyes. Look at those eyes. <gasps> oh my God. Oh, he's so elegant. Fabulous. <laughs> he's been a little bit sick. So I had to take him to the vet. But I think he's back to normal now. Whoa! So, what was I talking about? Yeah, so the heel. So I think, so I generally do a short row heel. So I was going to talk, do, do short rows. But um, what I might do is a heel flap and a gusset. I'm not sure. Short row heel is much faster. And it might be less painful for those people remembering those horrible times when they had to learn how to do a short row heel. Because I find that in, in Ireland, the nuns used to teach kids how to do it and they used to slap them if they got it wrong so they have very bad memories of sh of heels on socks mm, yeah so yeah I'm in the middle of writing up that pattern and doing that and <clears throat> having a handout to to give them so they can work on it and if they don't finish so yeah that's what I've been doing it's so exciting and nervous oh my god so, but what I'm actually I'm really excited about is um the fact that I can cast on something new once I finish my sweater, I can knit another sweater. So I put out a bit of a call and um, I got some lovely suggestions of patterns. So, um, and I was talking to, about this with Shannon. <clears throat> so there's been a lot of discussions and this is this seems to be like the, the phrase that everyone's using. There's a lot of discussions about racism in the knitting community. And yes, there have been quite a lot. And if you don't know what I'm talking about, um, basically it's about places, Places not being safe spaces for people of colour, and um, how and we're doing a lot of listening to the stories of people of colour uh, that are um, bl black, indigenous, and people of colour who are trying to tell us these things. And some people are being like not very nice about it, um, which is not very nice. So, um, what I'm trying to do is. Uh, I want to try to knit lots of patterns by designers of colour. I have enough yarn to do me for the rest of my life, otherwise I would be buying all the yarn from, from yarn dyes of colour as well. <laughs> but um, yeah, so what I wanted to do was try to avoid um, something called tokenism, which is basically where you do a performative thing of like, you know, I have loads of black friends or I you know this that, that the other thing that's not I don't want to put out a message that I'm just doing it for the look of the thing I'm looking at patterns that I have not seen because they're not in my feed because they're not being promoted as much as white people 
white designers would be. And it's an institutionalized kind of internal bias that we have been promoting a lot of um, designers over others because we don't see them as they're just not promoted because there is this internalized racism that a lot of people do. We want to buy things from people who look like us. And um, the more that the more that we promote people who say say white people, uh, we do have a lot of power in the community. We do have a lot of monetary power from lots of historic, for lots of historical reasons, colon colonial reasons, and disenfranchising, slavery, all of that. So we do have a lot of the money. Uh, we have a lot of the power, <clears throat> and we a lot of we have a lot of say. So we have to be careful and start to realize that the system which is put in place for our benefit um, maybe could start to be dismantled and <clears throat> to kind of open it out a little bit. So what I'm trying to do is um, find patterns that I want to knit um, by people of color. So I've been following um, Cotton and Cable. It's books and cables. Cotton cables I, I got it wrong. Um, I said Cotton and Cable. Whole, Sorry. I think she's got like three or four different um, highlights full of people of colour who are designing, who are dyeing, who are talking about knitting, who are knitting in the knitting community, uh, or crafting or creating um, in the crochet or um, sewing, uh, loads of different things. So it's an absolute treasure trove, absolutely amazing. So, uh, And I got a few suggestions and I'm looking at them at the moment. So there's a couple by um, uh, knit and crochet so there's a really nice halter neck top or, or it's actually a, um, I think she has a halter neck top but she also has a really lovely um, as if it's called the as if and I've got some lace and now it's made of mohair on top and then another dot another yarn down the bottom I think it's DK and I really don't like mohair so I was thinking about using lace on the top because you want like a sheer a sheer kind of um, see-through part on top and then and then the rest in a in a solid color to make it decent, you know. And it's inspired by one of my favorite movies of all time, Clueless, <laughs> where uh, like back in the nineties, you know, you'd wear like a a t shirt and then a halter neck over it, or like a strappy top over it. So it's inspired by that um, that kind of style, that nineties style. I love it. <laughs> as if. <laughs> so that's the as if tea. I really love that one. So it was um, Jessie Maid has a whole selection um, of summery tops, which are lovely. There's the ripple crop top, one, kind of with the halter neck, and the ripple just makes it really like, just I feel like the sizing would be very um, reasonable. As in, as in, you know, you put, you don't have to worry so much because it's it's stretchy, it'll fit. Um, she's also incredibly size inclusive as well. If you're interested, she's she does such a huge range of sizes. It's amazing. The swooping, um, the swooping, swooping scoop neck top is also gorgeous. So I bought two of those patterns. Oh, and I bought I think the bralette, ripple bralette, or maybe that was the crop top. Anyway, so. Yeah, I really recommend those ones. They're beautiful. And she had an incredible sale on. I don't know if it's still on, but it was like 35% off. I was like, get me all of them. So that was really nice. Thank you so much, Jessie. It was so sweet. Um, <clears throat> so those were kind of summery tops that I was looking for casting on. And I do want to cast those on. However, I was looking for like a sweater because I'm still kind of cold. So um, I put up a shout out uh, yesterday, last night actually. And I got a few really interesting ones. So one of them is from Emily Louise. She's a French designer. Uh, it's called the Enchanté, and it is unbelievable. It is so beautiful. I think it's she, it's like a drop sleeve sweater, but with this absolutely gorgeous lace at the front and a really lovely neckline. I think with a an I cord edge on it. It's beautiful and I want to cast it on yesterday. Gorgeous. And um, there's also, and I've, I've actually bought these patterns because I saw them instantly and I was like, I must have them. So Fatima Hines, um, she has done the twin vines and she's actually got two patterns up. One is a size, it's got sizes up to about 43, 45 inch bust. And then there's a twin vines plus, which has much larger patterns. Um, and if you buy two together, the pattern's only like one euro uh, more expensive. 
So if you're interested in uh, size inclusive designers uh, of pe uh, people of colour who are designers who are also size inclusive, Fatima is incredible as well. So the Twin Vines, I think I saw something like it in Walcott Yarns in a yarn story. But basically it has stripes all the way up, but they're, ca they're kind of like intensifying. So they're kind of uh, very, very quick stripes and then they, f they kind of... Um, get larger and wider which I love I love that kind of fadey fadey stripe thing um, but it's also got these incredible cables that run down and kind of break up the stripes and it's only a little t-shirt and I think it'd be really nice because I always wear these kind of long sleeve tops in, in winter but sometimes you want something a little bit warmer but you don't want the sleeve do you know so I'm thinking of making that as well with some gorgeous yarn that I have and it's very like it's quite a, a quick knit with a small amount of yardage so I love that too. And then the other one was by a stitch to wear, Grace Anna Farrell, who's been very outspoken in um, in the the knitting community at the moment, which is why I wanted to support her. But it's the trestle design, and it's amazing. Sorry, excuse me. It is unbelievable. It's in the um, it's in Brooklyn Tweed, I believe. Yeah, and it's a chevron based design. So um, this one now is not in the round. It's based on um, it's knitting garter, which I appreciate because I hate purling, but it's knitting pieces that you sew up. But because it's garter, I think I wouldn't mind that at all. Yeah. So because I think the main problem I have with um, knitting things flat is all the purling if you want to do a stock in it. So I'm going to put up a picture here. So you'll see that there's a beautiful chevron, deep chevron down the front, and then it actually matches up on the sides. And then the chevron actually carries on down the arm. It's gorgeous design and it's all garter and it looks so cozy and lovely and yummy. And yeah, so I want to knit those so badly. So if you're interested in joining me, like pop on over and have a look at their patterns. So, um, <clears throat> yeah, so I just wanted to, so when I was, I've been having trouble kind of talking about it on the podcast, talking about all these discussions that we've been having on the podcast. So I kind of needed to run things by someone. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about how the last few weeks have played out in my mind. So they, it all kind of kicked off. And uh, I was reading, I've been friends with um, a couple of the people who were shouting out about it at the start, uh, who were speaking out about it, sorry, not shouting. They were, they, the shouting came a little bit later. <laughs> but um, I've been friends with them, so I followed them and I, I didn't really know what was happening. And then I started reading and then I started being like, oh dear, I'm guilty of a lot of these things. I'm guilty of um, thinking the same way that a lot of people uh, like that, um, say Karen Templer, a uh, French supply company, I definitely thought like that when I was going traveling first, you know, definitely. I didn't know there was anything wrong with that. So yeah, I, there's a lot of times in my past that I look back on and sometimes I said things and then I knew that I'd said something wrong because it kind of sat wrong in my chest or my heart and just here. And other times I know that I didn't do the right thing and I could have done better but I just wanted to ignore it and pretend that it didn't exist and that's my privilege coming into play because basically I could do that. Um, I could ignore it. I could pretend that it never happened but it did. But these things happen. I'm not going to talk too much about it because I don't want to traumatise people. Um, who are watching. I know a lot of people um, watch the podcast who are friends of mine and I don't want to, I don't want to just make you realise because to be honest I'm talking to to white people when I say these things that I am a racist and I've done racist things but people who are of like who are being discriminated against they know because it's happening to them every day they know what we do they don't need to be reminded. So I'm not going to speak about what I've done. Um, I actually really ha feel the need to do it, to kind of admit it, but I can do that in therapy. So that's fine. <laughs> this is not the place. This is a place to talk a little bit about what we can maybe do better. Um, so 
yeah, um, there was a there there's there seems to be a little bit of um, <clears throat> a little bit of com competition between people who are angry and people who want to nicely say it nicely. And what I think is that both of those feelings are completely valid. I don't think there's a best way to do things. The best way to do things is the way, you know, everyone is so individual. Everyone has their own personal experiences. And there's like, there seems to be the angry and the nice. And everyone's kind of a bit cross about everything. And the thing is that everybody deserves to be heard. But I think that if people who are angry had not shouted about it, no one would be paying attention. Being nice about it has not worked. Because we're all talking about it now. We weren't talking about this before. Before the angry came out. Before the, they, they, they basically shot over the parapet of the, of the castle of whiteness. You know, they, they, they shot a cannonball right through us. And then we just peeped the head out to look and see what was happening. And they're there just being like, come on, listen to us, look at us, find us, search for us, see that we're here. And we're finally breaking down that wall now and we're working through it. And it's a lot of work because it's a big, 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 big thing that's right in the middle. It's an invisible wall that, and we are kind of up here hiding behind it, hiding behind the whiteness, the white privilege, and it's not okay. And we need to work on it and we need to start listening and we need to break down that wall. Break it down, break it down. So everyone is on a level playing field. That's gonna take years, decades, a long time, a long time. It's not gonna be fixed in two weeks. It's not gonna be fixed in three weeks. It's not gonna be fixed by one video. It's not going to be fixed unless we all work hard at realizing the the trauma and the history behind why some people are perceived to are some people have more privilege not perceived they have more privilege and some don't and yeah so that's something that I'm working through in my brain anyway um yeah so what I want to talk a little bit about as well is on the same kind of vein um I've been listening to a lot of podcasts I've been listening to a lot of um podcasts that are not knitting related um but there's a very interesting one called Tara Noya and it's been it's uh it's by Tara Flynn who is a an Irish comedian actress uh actor um and she is she was actually a huge, she had a huge, huge role in my experience of the Repeal the Eighth Movement. She has been very outspoken about it and she suffered greatly from people who were on the other side who disagreed with repealing the Eighth Amendment and she was attacked um, verbally uh, on online and she suffered financially quite a lot from it. And... Um, yeah, so she started a podcast as a way to have her own thoughts and feelings heard without the filter of social media, which is so interesting. That's kind of what that's kind of what a podcast is a little bit. It's about getting your point across without being interrupted, talked over and someone playing devil's advocate. So there was one podcast of Tara's um, with a lady in direct provision called Ellie Kisiombe. And um, Ellie is a an amazing woman. She never sleeps. <laughs> but she is uh, currently in direct provision. And I'm just going to, I've got some notes here. Um, so a lot of people will not have heard about direct provision or what it is. Um, and it is Ireland's answer to the refugee crisis. And... Um, people seeking asylum in Ireland. So direct provision was set up in 2000, the year 2000, and it was said that basically it was accommodation for refugees to come into the country and stay for up to six months while their application was being processed. There are 35 uh, direct provision centres in Ireland, seven are state owned and 28 are for profit, which is a problem. At the moment, um, according to this website that I that I uh, looked up, um, there are 5,400 people in direct provision and 1,500 of these people are children. Um, so the issue with direct provision 
um, according to what I've been listening to, what I've been reading and um, what I've been kind of um, looking into um, is that it is not up to six months. At the moment, the, the time frame is between one year and 10 years. So there have been people in, the average stay is two years. Um, so this is a problem obviously with um, the, the processing of refugees in Ireland. <clears throat> when this was set up, I remember, um, I was quite, I was young, I was about 18, no, 2000, 2000, I was only, oh gosh, I was born in 1987, what is that? I was 13 years old, so I was 14, 15. So when direct provision was getting its legs, getting started, I was kind of a teenager, I was starting to go out, I was starting to, you know, have conversations with people that were different to like my family and my, you know, things like that. You don't really, you're not really interested in politics when you're a teenager. Well, you weren't back in the 90, back into the 2000s. People are now, thank God. But, um, um, yeah, so I started going out and, um, like when I was 15, 16, 17, I started going out and getting taxis home and stuff. And the taxi driver, I remember having one conversation with the taxi driver and he was basically like, they're coming over here and they're getting everything for free. They're getting shoes for free. They're getting socks for free. They're getting accommodation. They're getting bed for free. Like there's loads of homeless Irish people, nobody, like everyone else has to work. Why do we have to pay for these people coming over to take all of our, you know, stuff for free? And I was just like, what, you know, I don't, I don't know what you're talking about. Just kind of entertaining them just to kind of get me home safe, continue, whatever. I was kind of young and didn't really have a clue. So this is the kind of conversation that I had uh, probably like I overheard or I had or whatever a load of times. And um, from this podcast, then Ellie was talking about how actually direct provision was set up to incite this racist opinion of refugees coming into Ireland. So when a refugee comes in, they get put into direct provision. They um, they're not able to cook for themselves. They're fed three times a day by a canteen. They um, are not, uh, they're not allowed to work. They're not allowed to go on the social welfare system, obviously, because they're not working. Um, they, everything is provided for them, yes, but they cannot choose. Um, so they have no um, autonomy. Um, they're allowed to go out, but they get, a, they get an allowance of 21 euros 60 cent per week, per person. Um, so you can't really do much with that. Um, um, and I think the thing that annoys me the most is that they're not allowed to work. So what happens then is that people see that they're getting all this stuff for free and they're not even working. They're just sleeping. They're just, you know, they're getting fed. They can't do anything, you know, and people get really annoyed at that. And that is a system that was set up. You know, and it has resulted, maybe it wasn't on purpose, but it has resulted in an incredible racist reaction from people who um, are looking at these people getting, like being really annoyed that they get everything for free. And it's infuriating. So uh, the, the rate of um, mental health uh, illnesses are five times higher than the than the rate in the in the general public in Ireland in indirect provision, there is um it's 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 really not good. Um, Ellie has actually set up uh, something called Our Table, and what it means is that she's set up this um uh, a kitchen. She sets up this kitchen and she brings people in and she feeds for them because she loves cooking. That's her thing. She loves feeding people. She loves having a load of people, hundreds of people around cooking a big massive meal and have everyone around chatting and talking and, and conversing and just be a building a community. She's a community builder. She's actually running for office and um, she's running for political office in the new year, I think. And I'm like, oh my God, she sounds incredible. I want to be her friend. She's so nice. So uh, it's something that I I knew was happening and I didn't really I didn't really do anything and I didn't really look into it. So that is something that I'm going to change. Um at the moment I'm taking on quite a lot, so I might need your your guys' help. <laughs> so if you are Irish and you're watching this podcast, there are a number of things that you can do to help. 
Um, I have written down a list because I looked it up. So I'm going to I'm going to um, add this um, information down below in the website and you click through there and you can go through a lot of things. Mainly what needs to be done is political change. Uh, it needs to be changed from the government's perspective. So we need to lobby our politicians and you can do that on mytd.ie. You can find your TD and uh, send them an email about things. But first, what you need to know is how to educate yourself about this system. So um, you need to become educated because then you will know why things are the way they are and maybe how you can change them, what you want to, what you want to change because you know immigration is a very sensitive topic and a lot of people are like there was a there was a, a referendum passed a couple of years ago that said if a child is born in the country it doesn't automatically give them citizenship rights. And that was uh, directly against uh, an immigration, basically people coming in, having children and then just getting all the rights, um, which I believe is is a criminal offence. But anyway, whatever. That's my own personal opinion. So um, if you're interested in becoming educated, there's some, some great websites, Doris Limney, Maasai, um, NASC and the Irish Refugee Council. Um, so there's a couple of different um, maybe alternatives that might be more suitable, maybe taking the um, the for profit centers, you know, making it not for profit, because if they just want to make money out of it, they're obviously going to get really, really poor quality living quarters and they never they don't have a say in anything. These people can't leave either. They, they can't leave. Otherwise, they start the refugee process all over again. So Ellie hasn't been home to see her family in about 10 years or eight years, um, she's got loads of family members who've, who've like passed away and she couldn't get home to the funeral um, because if she did, she would, you know, she would have gone right back to the start again. So it's an incredibly unjust system. Um, so I think the main thing would be shorter waiting times for these people's refugee status to be um, expedited. So they're not in there for 10 years and like a child going in there at eight could go through until they're 18 or 20, you know, or eight, like 18, and they've had all of their formative years in this open prison. Um, should they have full access to social welfare and live in the community? Um, should they, um, what, what, like, th there's certain things which you need to look up on and see what your personal stances are. Um, but the only way that we can end direct provision or reduce down the amount of waiting that they have to do in direct provision is to lobby lobby the government. And in Ireland, it's actually really easy to do. You email your TD, you talk to them, you might know them, you know. Um, you can also actually, the, the Minister for Justice is Charlie Flanagan and the Minister for, Minister for State Equality and Immigration and Integration is David Stanton. So you can contact them directly and um, they are the ones with the, the highest power. Um, so if, if we could like, you know, start lobbying because that they're there the government is there to do what we want them to do that's that's we have a say in our own country we have a say in our government and in Ireland it's really easy to lobby because you just have to send them an email it's it, lobbying is something that you you hear a lot about like big companies doing for the government and yes they have more power but it, actually the Irish people have quite a lot of power too so if we were able to if we were able to get together and send in these emails about how we feel about direct provision and how inhumane it is. Yeah. There's also um, there's a there's a campaign called the Right to Work campaign, which I really believe in because Ireland is in full employment at the moment. It is um, I think it, there's a there's a rate uh, about I think if it goes down to five percent unemployment, it's it's said to be full employment because there's a lot of people who can't work for different reasons. But um, if it's about if it, if if the percentage is as low as 5%, Ireland is known to be fully, like it has full employment. So there are a load of job opportunities. We are actually importing a lot of jobs from abroad. Um, and these people in direct provision could be providing, you know, could be working, could be paying tax, could be paying, you know, they want to work, they want to come, they want to be part of Ireland. They wouldn't have come all this way, you know, to escape their you know, lives where they were being persecuted. There's actually, I, I read this lovely story about a um, a farm up in County Sligo or Mayo who have taken on a number of um, Syrian olive growers uh, to maintain their their um, 
uh, their orchards because orchards and like trees it's it's really relatable so actually they're learning so much from the Syrian olive growers and uh, then the, the Syrians are learning a lot from the Irish practices and it's just so fulfilling like if you if you are able to work if you are able to create something to develop something to make something happen it, it provides meaning for your world and if you are restricted from doing that for from contributing to society that's when your mental health goes um, there's also a lot of community groups that actually work within the direct provision centers so you can actually reach out to them and see if you can volunteer your time I was thinking about um, going in and starting a, a craft group um, I'll see if I have the time to do it. Um, I have quite a lot going on, but I would love to do that at some point. I would love to reach out and um, hopefully try and get people to um, to help reaching out, reach out and, and, and welcome these people to Ireland because they want to be Irish. They want to be contributing members of our society and we need them. We need people to come over and work. We need people to do the work. Um, there's a lot of there's a lot of jobs out there at the moment, and it'd be criminal to have these people sitting, sitting, just sitting there, doing nothing. You know, it's it's criminal, according to me. I think personally. Um, yeah. So that that's kind of what I wanted to talk about this week. Um, it's a little bit of a, a sensitive topic because I don't really know too much about it, but that's the problem. It's it's kind of been kept from us a little bit. We don't really want, we know it's there. We don't really want to think about it. We don't really want to talk about it. It's the Magdalen Laundries all over again. Uh, and it's not okay. The There's a lot of stories about abuses that are happening in these centres. It's not okay. So if you are Irish or you know somebody that's Irish or you have some family in Ireland, reach out to them and ask them to send an email to their local TD to ask for an end to direct provision because it needs to be done. Speed up, speed up those applications, hire more people, hire more people, get them into the jobs and get them working through that paperwork because it's very important. It's people's lives, people's lives at risk, at risk. So there you go. Thank you so much for joining me today. Um, I, I'm really hungry, my stomach is growling, I haven't had breakfast yet, so I'm going to go do that, I finish the sleeve on my sweater, and uh, start looking up and start typing up an email to my local TD. So thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you next week. Bye.